here I'm speaking as I represent FAME, which is the Trade Association for Commercial Companies in UK and Irish Archaeology. So this, uh, this came from FAME and CBA. And, and CBA. The, we told the government that our major, one major concern for archaeologists results from this relating to the imposition of salary thresholds to serve as a proxy for skilled immigration. The, the point of that £30,000 is a, the thought in bureaucracy that anyone who is skilled must be paid, 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 paid £30,000. We <coughs> thought this is not a satisfactory method for apportioning visas and could lead to a restriction on the sector's ability to recruit skilled archaeologists. And so this has then led to archaeology being placed on the uh, shortage occupations list, provisional shortage occupations list, which essentially might be a route around that need for salaries to be proxies for qualification and skill. So that £30,000 may not really be relevant for archaeology anymore, yes. although it was, of course, at, it, is, it is very significant that it's being talked about, and especially when it's talked about in terms of archaeological salaries. But the sector as a whole pushed back and the, the, the Migratory, uh, migration advisory service accepted that pushing back. I, I agree with you, but uh, my, my French reaction is that's different. You, you, are, you are concerned with having a sufficient number of, of, uh, of employees in order yeah. to, if HS or whatever happened, uh, I'm concerned with the fact that I want uh, every archaeologist to have a decent salary. Uh, that's my priority. Uh, that that um, uh, if if you can't have it both ways, if it's a, a, a skill, you know, people have done a, a BA and a master and whatever, uh, and they are paid uh, eight times less than the diggers who have uh, nothing. There's a problem there. So why not uh, uh, instead of running along the stream and telling, okay, well, you see, uh, we don't get a lot of money. That's all right. That's all right. We have low salary, but we have skills. So please allow uh, the poles that. The, the, do it the other way around, be revolutionary, mm -hmm. can he? And say, look, uh, if you want, I can, there's a law, uh, whatever, like, uh, uh, H, uh, what is it called now? Um, uh, the, um, poly, you know, what was the 16, PPG 16, and the yeah. recent uh, yeah. policy framework, yeah. I don't yeah. know, yeah. if, uh, one page. Okay. Uh, if you want archaeology to happen, raise the salaries, because you need to recognize that this is a, a skill that, uh, Okay. okay. If, you, if you say this is a, we are a very important skill, but forget about the money. It's important for other people. Um, you are losing a um, bargain chip. But a lot. Um, remember, of course, we, we, we share so many things, including opposing views on many things. Yeah. People are revolutional, but I do not believe. I utterly do not believe it is the role of government to tell us how much we should get paid. No, it's your role because look, so archaeologists are systematically, systematically archaeologists have the worst pay graduates in humanities and social sciences in Britain. Okay. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, uh, that's, 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 a, that's an exciting discussion we can have about okay. the, the, role, but, but, of, the okay. role of charities as employers in the UK. Okay. That's another point, but what I'm saying here is uh, this is why it's a silver lining because it reshuffles uh, the cards a second and, and it says um, the criteria of money, which is worth what it's worth. But that's, this is the moment when you say, hold on, uh, 30,000, so you must increase not only, of course, the poems who will come and get 30,000, but uh, all of us, uh, we should get a decent salary, and therefore we should charge more the developers, okay? And therefore we should maybe change our uh, you know, uh, competitive model so that there is a basic minimum for each uh, you know, contract that you receive. Okay, that, that's an opportunity, because otherwise, uh, you know. Anyway, the, the days are difficult, yes? Uh, so. Uh, there it. Unfortunately, I think thirty thousand is not a it's not a pig on the wing. It's a dead cat. It's it's not it's not. So make it twenty five. But uh, no, no, we don't want to be making setting any numbers. We don't want to tell the government no, you must say. If you don't set any numbers, you know, end up with uh, again with the situation which is abnormal. You, you remember the tables we did in the ACE project as well. We compared yeah. the average salary. So uh, it was you who gave us the, the data in Britain or in England. I think it was England, not Britain. In, in England. Uh, the average archaeological salary is 78% of, of 100, okay? And in Cyprus, remember this one, you yeah. wanted to learn, uh, you, you are sad because you had to learn Greek. Yeah, in Cyprus, so uh, uh, an average salary of an archaeologist is 144. Yes, yeah, the comparison of average archaeological okay. salaries with average for all. For all jobs. professions or whatever it is. So, uh, 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 so there's a moment to do something about it, no? 
Don't <laughs> part. No, I'll, I'll, okay, last thing, sorry, last, yes. last thing. But the point there is that in Cyprus, there were 98 paid archaeologists in the whole country, yeah, and, and in the UK, there were uh, 7,000. Yeah. And so 7,000 times 78%. Okay. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. The, country, the countries, but in general, the countries where there is commercial archaeology, there are a lot more people, a lot more jobs, a lot more people. Yeah, it's a less efficient system. system. More efficient system. I completely agree. It's less efficient because you can, uh, you don't have the economy scale. You don't have. Okay, never mind. That's another debate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, good. just next year's. Next year's. Uh, we don't go into that debate. Sorry. We won't go into that debate about if it's better to have commercial archaeology or state archaeology. No. I have right. that in Germany a lot. Mm. So, so we can discuss about that. Very long. Okay, but what I think, if I may, the, the, my, uh, my my main point is really is the, because I, uh, we had a, a word like this, just, is that I think we need to, um, um, I understand uh, the impulse and the interest and the uh, psychological need to do something and, and, and to work abroad and uh, etc. But let's do it uh, uh, fully aware that there is, uh, you know, three good centuries of various types of engagements. And that you cannot escape, even, you know, you work with Ibrahim Machiao in uh, Senegal, so Ibrahim is very nice, but you are British, European, white, in, uh, you know, Western Africa, uh, black, etc. You are, th th no escaping, okay? So take this into account when you... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> This is what, to, to stop it working. Good morning, everybody. Um, I guess at this stage, <coughs> I, it is typical to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, but as I'm one of the organizers, although not according to the app, um, um, uh, that's perhaps superfluous. But I would also like, <coughs> and this picks up on um, Nathan's last point, actually, the Heritage Alliance and the British Council for paying for me to be here. Uh, why are they paying for me to be here? Well, it's part, uh, Heritage Alliance is paying for me to be here because it's very interested in promoting heritage and heritage practice. Um, it's an English organization, but it's very interested in English organizations that work overseas as well. Um, and the British Council, why? Because it wants to promote UK values around the world. And it sees heritage and particularly archaeology as a means of doing that. And CIFA has made it very clear to the, the parent department of this initiative, which is Digital Culture, Media and Sport, that we are very happy to collaborate with Her Majesty's Government on this, um, but to recognise that we do it for a different reason. If it is mutually helpful for them to fund us and promote a bit of UK values, well, that's fine. But actually, our mission is not to promote UK values. Our promotion is to promote good practice in, in archaeology. And that they know that there, are, there is a percentage of our membership that is very averse to the idea of promoting UK values and finds that quite offensive. So it, it, let's be open about this. I will promote some UK values later on, but that's not the sole purpose here. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to say by way of introductions, of course, it, seen this before, <coughs> we, are, we, 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 we are divided, and I am divided, because I have personal views and I have corporate views. Um, and uh, with careful bit of logo engineering, there's a CIFA logo at the top of the page, um, you may be able to distinguish between the two as I go, and I'll try not to, 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 to get, it, get it wrong. Um, this session isn't just about Brexit. Um, this paper is about Brexit. This session is not just about Brexit. It's about borders. It's, and now, other, Michaela give us, gave us the introduction. There's lots of other countries that are busy building walls at the moment, and generally they're not helping very much. Um, uh, and they may have been all right in the north of England um, a, a few centuries back, but uh, they're, they're, they're not helping in the world. Um, uh, and I want to emphasize the positive, but we, 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 we have to deal with some realities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about causes, a little bit about professional consequences, 
and reactions. And I hate the fact that the screen doesn't show what's being projected. And um, and, and and talk a little bit about um, some professional emotional consequences as well. And let's see how united we are. As Nathan says, we're all friends here, but we're part of a larger community where there are mixed views and there are even some progress of archaeologists, apparently. A um, little bit of cause is... Uh, it's relatively recently that Great Britain became an island of continental Europe, um, uh, but it, it, it has caused problems, uh, and uh, you will be familiar with the. This is supposed to be an apocryphal headline, but I have actually, I haven't, because I'm mean, I haven't spent the money to get the screenshot. But 22nd of October 1957, um, heavy fog in the Channel That's cuts the off the continent. The invention of this uh, concept is, is 1957. Uh, th this, this headline is from okay. 1957. I'm from 1957, but not. Um, uh, but I, I didn't write the headline. I was too young. Um, and so, so there's there's the problem. And I think really, you know, rising sea levels and rising nationalism would only make the problem worse. And possibly, you know, a greater amount of fog is is, is building up in the in the channel as we speak. Um, and I don't think we want to spend a lot of time on the causes. We discussed that a lot at previous EAAs, but we, I think what we need to know is how to cope with the future. And as previous speakers have said, you know, we managed international cooperation quite well before the EU even existed. But what we're dealing with now is change, and change always has to be coped with. Um, but let's remember that there is this uniquely UK, dare I say English, view of the rest of Europe, whereby anything outside England is different and cut off. And, you know, popular press, it goes, you know, these kind of attitudes. Go, yeah, yeah, indeed. It is, it is you know, Titania was, was, did not take the same positive view of, of, of Bottom. Uh, this, this is, I don't have the date of this anymore because I cut it out, I'm afraid, but it's, it's the 1990s. But that's, uh, that's a horrendous attitude that was, uh, was around in the popular press. Um, but as, as, as Nathan was saying, that, you know, there is history. The, 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 the Brexit position should not be a surprise to us. Um, and it, it includes all of our thinking. So CIFA is now going through another period of strategic planning. And it's so hard to get away from thinking, you know, the, the Brexit analogies. The analogies are everywhere. Um, and uh, at a time of change and reform, it's, it's very hard not to... To, to, to look at, at Brexit. And I just want to talk a little bit about, again, change and, and resistance to change, because I think there, there are some analogies we can work with. In an organisation like CIFA, you can, you can have wonderful managerial diagrams that are pretty hard to interpret. Um, but in an organisation, particularly in a membership organisation, there will be different appetites for change. And if, say, let's take CIFA for example, if the CIFA board and its staff are right at the front of the appetite for change, then we are going to hit, and we recently have hit, a lot of conservative reaction. Um, if we're too far back, we're going to be seen as, 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 as a long way behind. So, you know, too close to the leading edge, members are alienated. We found that. If you're too close to the training edge, you don't achieve anything. So that'd be very boring. We don't like that. Um, my feeling is that in a, in a membership organisation, you want about 20% of people to be ahead of you, saying you're slow, you know, they're really impatient radicals. And you want to have about 80% of the people behind you being stubborn conservatives. And I, I think even you know, some recent debates we probably got, well, maybe we were, probably were about that figure, but we needed 75% of people with us. Um, and if you're not careful, you get a two-speed professional association. And of course, we've had a two-speed Europe. Was it, was it ever love? The British relationship, the UK relationship with, with, with the EU. You know, some people wanted political union. Other people wanted free trade. Some people were in the relationship for commitment. For others, it was transactional. It's like personal relationships. Yeah, sometimes there's a mismatch in what people want. Um, 
Sometimes there's a mismatch in what people want out of, out, out, out of, out of the relationship. Um, so I think we just have to, to, to bear that in mind that it's possible that Britain is a self-centered middle-aged man with commitment issues and that that's something that we have to live with or live without. What we want to do is maintain a relationship. We want to work together. Um, let's not have that kind of relationship breakdown that I alluded to earlier. So there is an opportunity for us to express our love to each other as colleagues, as friends, as allies. We do need to explain that actually the relationship we've had in the past can be covered differently. We can change. Um, we could try that really un-British thing of listening as well as talking. We could actually, maybe all of us in this room could learn that lesson. Uh, and, and just generally make, it, make, it, make an effort, share the washing up. Um, now, Kenny's talked about this a little bit. We have made an effort. Um, what to see for the token, token efforts, you know, postcards in eight, eight different languages just to explain who we are. That was the immediate reaction in 2016 after that ghastly vote. We had a conference, which many of you spoke at, uh, as uh, uh, the, um, the archaeology is a global profession. Um, and of course, okay, thank you very much. We set up Sie für Deutschland um, at the invitation of our German archaeological friends. Well, actually, our German archaeological friends set up Sie für Deutschland with us. And importantly, the EAA reminded itself that it's an association for European archaeologists, not for EU archaeologists. It could probably stand to remind itself of that again. It is disappointing that the board was unable to provide a speaker for this session. It's disappointing that the board can't provide an audience for this session as well. Uh, but obviously we can re report back to them what, what has happened. Back in, back, in, back in the UK, um, we have got some issues. 40% of, of UK law derives from the European Union. All of that's going to be carried forward for now um, because it's impossible to do otherwise. But then I'm sure if we continue with the flavour of government that we have at the moment, things will change. Environmental legislation will change. Common agricultural policy will not apply. It's, it, it's through the, the common agricultural policy that most of the protection of the historic environment in rural areas takes place in the UK. So there's a lot of stuff up for grabs, and of course CIFA is, is doing its best with government on that. And the two relevant bills are currently going through Parliament, but prorogue, I knew that lovely new word that, that, that Mark has learned. Uh, all bills that are in progress end when Parliament is prorogued. So we really don't know what's going to happen at the end of that. And we've had an interesting and uh, uh, spirited debate about the end of the freedom of movement and, uh, uh, and uh, archaeology. Um, CIFA campaign successful. Of course, full acknowledgement to uh, our colleagues from FAME who assisted us with, with, with the statistics for that. Um, the, the, the archaeology has been added. The, the recommendation um, from the Migration Advisory Committee that archaeology is added to the shortage occupation list. What that actually means in real world, we don't know because we don't know what the rules will be. But there is a silver lining from that, and it might not be the £30,000, which would have been a great silver lining. But the other silver lining is it's a governmental organisation recognising that archaeology is an important skill. Okay, mm -hmm. That might be the step towards other people recognising it, like the employers, for example, and paying £30,000 to each and every one of us. Or more, even. Um, and so, building bridges between UK and other other archaeologists. That, that's a, that's a bridge across the border, by the way. So was the last one. Um, used to be the border, anyway. Barry on tweet, sort of a little bit can, um, unsure about which country it's in, but it, it, administratively it's in England at the moment. But there's the tweet, and there's. And there's a train, and there's a CIFA campaign. Did you know there was a CIFA campaign going? Well, it's kind of, this is it. It's, it, it, it's right here, right now. Um, the question we want to know, 
and I hope the discussions will help us with it, how we're going to get this better integration of research, of learning, of, of practice. Um, we are going to have potentially new approaches to the environment and agriculture, as I mentioned. What can we learn in the management of these issues in the UK from our friends elsewhere? There must be stuff to learn. There will be, Malcolm's point, a more even, I didn't use the word fair, a more even sharing of research funding if UK universities get their hands out of the pot. Now that's a real problem for the UK universities, it's a real problem for archaeology generally, but an evening out is almost certainly necessary. And why, do we, why don't we forget about the UK soft power and work on European soft power? Um, and then, of course, the other thing we need to do is explain to the people who see fog in the channel and asylum seekers eating bottom um, the multicultural shared history of the UK. And we're not getting anywhere with that really? at the moment. I don't think. I don't think. Well, the Daily Mail. I don't read the Daily Mail, but I don't think the Daily Mail is getting it. Um, Bridge across the Tweed. Uh, I think we can, we can observe the constitutional crisis because that's quite an interesting archaeological profession um, uh, it, uh, <coughs> and, and activity. Um, and I think we can observe that, uh, you know, it's not just the problems we're having at the moment, not just caused by evil people taking back control from democratic institutions and I have to distance myself from my, my, my institution now. Some of it is about good people failing um, and safeguards failing. One of the things we have in the UK, one of the things built into our unwritten constitution, maybe it's about time it was written, folks. Um, well, there's eight words of it, but we need a bit more. Is the safeguard against bad government is a strong and effective opposition. They're not... There, the, the Westminster system, in my view, is just not designed. It's, it, it, it is designed to deal with wickedness and evil and undemocratic, deliberately undemocratic activities, but it's just not capable of dealing with idleness, incompetence, uh, divisions within parties is built on a party system, and when the party system breaks down, it doesn't work, and, and it, it's not built to deal with a lack of imagination. Um, and there are, there are lessons that could be learned from history. There are lessons that Westminster needs to learn from, from other countries. And then, yeah, back to, I, I made this point in my introduction. Um, I am not here as an agent of UK soft power, but I am very happy to promote these UK values, which may look a little unfamiliar to you at the moment. Um, peace and stability, remember that? Mm -hmm. Democracy. Strong, strong and steady. Yeah, strong and, st strong and stable, that's it. Yeah. Uh, tolerance and respect, freedom of expression, rule-based systems. Um, these are UK values. You can't judge a country by its government. I think we can see that. Uh, around the world, uh, I will say nothing about the electorate of 96,000 people. Um, and I think it shows us, doesn't it? I think we're learning that, 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 that uh, democratic institutions and, 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 and tolerance values are very, very vulnerable. Um, and, and really, what, what, what do I want to say? I want to say, Look, at, look, look after these exports. I mean, these are values that are traditionally strong in the UK. They're not very strong in the rhetoric now, but they're values that are not uniquely in the UK. Of course they're not. I think we need to hand this over to other countries now to look after and nurture in our absence. And hopefully they'll still be there when we come back. It's also incredibly important to protect the EU. And I'm saying this now as a Brit, so I should have dropped... The EU is the European Union. The Union, you mean the European Union or the UK? Union? I, I, in this case, I'm talking about the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can have the other conversation some other time. But yeah, I should have taken the logo off for this point. But 
I think at this stage, the UK government is negotiating hard with the with the EU to get things changed, and I think that needs to be well, or, or is it? It's only wishes to have. It, want, it wants a lot of favours. You've got to look after the European Union. That's more important than looking after the UK. And I think we need to look after, you know, look after now the European countries that have more to offer than the UK. Um, enough of that. Professional responses. Um, what can we do? This is what we want to have a discussion about now. Is is, is what can we do? How how can how can we help each other? How can we reduce those administrative barriers that, that exist? Of course, it's the mental barriers that are the real ones, but the administrative barriers are gritting the machinery that would be nice to flush out. Um, do you remember doing that with your car? Uh, there's all the other non-Brexit-related barriers to, to transnational movements, which we talked about uh, at the session. Where were we? Maastricht. We were building bridges again. Uh, Let's, let's work with the UK shortage occupation list and see what we can do with that to, 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 to promote more movement um, uh, in and out of the UK. But this is not just what this is about. Uh, and um, then there's the emotional responses. We need to just look after each other and, and, and over, overcome, overcome the failed politics. Um, it's not a done deal. It's not a done not... It's, it's, it, it's not a done, a done no deal. Um, so I think those, 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 are, the, those are the questions that, that I'm putting to you, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, the, 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 these, are the, these, are, these are the questions I have. Um, uh, there may be others, but dear colleagues, how, how are we as European archaeologists going to continue to collaborate, overcome the problems that are caused by a temporary political crisis in one country and overcome the problems that are much more long-standing um, that make us fearful of moving across barriers, but also, as Nathan has said, make us sometimes very arrogant and destructive when we do move across those barriers. Thank you very much. Okay.